So hello and welcome back to our My Secret Life project, where we speak to people who experienced challenges in their life, particularly um, on the inside, and who are hiding it from the outside world. And we're speaking with them about what they saw that changed everything, and brought them out of the darkness and into the light. And today it's my special pre a pleasure, well, English is sometimes not so easy for me after speaking <laughs> German so long, my special pleasure <laughs> to introduce Rob Cook. Um, he spoke recently on the 3P conference that I watched virtually uh, from Switzerland. Where were you coming? Were you in LA at the time when you yes, were? Yes, that's where I'm at now. Yes, in LA. Yeah. And um, I, I felt a real special connection with Rob. Um, he spoke a little bit about his experience as a soldier. Um, as a military member, and I have a lot of members in the family, my family, who are in the military, my brother who passed away in Afghanistan, and um, some of the things that Rob was talking about really spoke to how I was thinking about similar situations, and um, I'm just so happy that you're here, Rob, that we can connect and we can hear your your story. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure. Um, when you when you get an opportunity to connect with people who who resonate with your story, because oftentimes stories are used to kind of hold us back to create mm -hmm. more fears or or for us to hide. And I think now that I'm starting to see like, no, the sharing of my story is helping people heal. Yeah, It's kind of like digging down deep and making sure I, I put it all out in the sense where somebody could see something whether that be a kid from the neighborhoods like I grew up in, or whether that be a military member suffering from PTSD like I did, or whether it just be a new coach who is trying to start his practice like I am, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I just really enjoy sharing it in a way that I hope helps people. So I'm super excited about being here. No, it's such a blessing, Rob. It's so cool. And yeah, let's just start off by maybe you taking us back to a time in your life where you felt like you were struggling and you feel like you maybe were not showing to the outside world what you were feeling on the inside and it's your stage just <laughs> get in there oh, man. <laughs> we can start uh i was born in 1997 i mean 1977 i mean that's 1997 no not no 77 i'm sorry uh so i don't do math out in public but no i guess the the easiest way or, or place that would, would set it up would just paint paint a picture of, of what my origins were like. Um, so I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama and in, in the late 70s, as I said. So we're talking about maybe less than 15 years from the Voter Registration Act and the march in Selma being conducted. Mm -hmm. So still very high racially tense area. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in the inner city, which means that uh, we lived in housing projects for the majority of my life, uh, which every housing projects throughout America are filled with violence, um, gangs, drugs, and things like that. So I got accustomed to that, that way of life as, um, I guess you would say, as a, as a norm. Um, but it never felt right. It never, it never felt like it was me. Um, so much so that I didn't, I didn't join a gang because I wanted to. I joined the gang because it was a simple math equation. It's much easier to fight five guys once and have a team with you versus fight every day of your life because you're not a part of anything. Mm -hmm. It was a math, um, it was a flip, you know, like a- it's, A bad it's, equation. It's, yeah, yeah, it just, <laughs> just makes sense, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on into even the, um, the way I would force my younger brother not to have his own experience and and you know, fight him and, and beat on him to make him, you know, this hardened shell because I was taking off of the military and, and the fear that he would be devoured if he didn't learn how to have a quick temper, if he wasn't if he didn't have a violence of action to his way of life, mm -hmm. um, so that he could survive. And when I got into the military, it was quite interesting because in basic training, what they do is they basically gut what you consider to be your identity. And I used to think it was unity they was creating, but actually what they were creating was uniformity. It was crush what you believe you are, put you all in the same uniform. You look alike, so you start to believe you are alike. And that um, way of life became very interesting because 
honestly, now looking back on it, it really just felt like I switched games. Um, mm-hmm. it, it really, because I, I carried now more guns. Um, I could only have my express anger toward a group of people. Um, there were loyalty things, unwritten rules. There were, there was a, a rank structure that was like it at the time it, I didn't pay attention to it, but now it looks like it was the same, um, Mm -hmm. just different colors. And, and that, um, most of the military basically is where I began to grow. I did all my twenties there, all of my thirties. I retired in 2017 after 21 years. So most of my, most of my experience of, uh, as an adult was traveling the world and learning things that I believe were true, weren't true. And the more and more I would experience something like that, the more and more I would go in a hole. Mm -hmm. And um, I developed a a characteristic, so to speak, of my shield was my ability to entertain. My shield was my ability to make people laugh. My shield was how hard I worked out. Those things kept people from ever asking me what was going on in my mind because everybody automatically assumed I was okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was kind of like whenever anybody poked, it was so overwhelming, so pressure filled that I was, I would have popped. If anybody would have asked me any question other than your normal, subtle or surface level questionings on how you're doing, I would have fell to pieces. Um, And that was mainly because I was in a, a male dominated space doing protective services. So our job was similar to the motorcades you see around a US president Mm -hmm. or the high ranking officials in the Department of Defense. So driving of motorcades, fighting, carrying guns, flying helicopters, you know, being in spaces where you don't have conventional forces support, it's you and your other teammates. So you kind of have a different uh, dynamic, very untraditional. walking into a place I've never been before and then requesting their entire staff listen to me for the six days we're on the ground here, trying to figure out how to get them to do everything I need them to do um, in their country, which I don't understand the culture. And I got my US rules or my military rules. And it was just like uh, a crazy time, Mm -hmm. a, a real crazy time, but a lot of invoking a presence that wasn't authentic. It was walking in the door and making people believe I was the shit. I knew what I was talking about. Don't question me. Um, But I was nervous as hell, scared as hell, and trying to figure it out. Um, And I studied my job. I I, I believe I was very, very good at it. Um, Not because of anything I was trained. Again, hindsight looking back, it was on really pointing to those times in in my military career where wisdom had to take over that I just responded Mm -hmm. those are the things that pretty much my career were built on and that wasn't part of my training or part of my thinking it was just me responding when it happened um so I kind of knew I had a little sum in me but I just felt it was broken I felt it was it was capped and it would always have to fit in some type of box that somebody else had prescribed for me so if there was a an incident of racism or or a race relations issue, then I as a black man had to respond with this anger and this way, even if I felt it or not. If there was an issue with soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and Coast Guardmen, as a veteran, I had to respond a certain way. And sometimes those didn't fit me. They didn't fit me at all, honestly. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I would respond accordingly. I would happily get into that box, cram myself in um, and and try to make it work for for everyone else. And it led to an extreme amount of suffering. Mm -hmm. Um, It it led to probably years of more gallons of alcohol than I would like to say I drink, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, years of, of. At the time, reckless. It's, it's the only thing I could, I could think of now, but, but going places, embassies say you shouldn't go for fear of dying. Um, they were just um, going to extremely intense areas, volunteering for it, 
yeah. you know, practicing for it, waiting, getting, getting so good at the ability to shoot, fight, and run that it was almost like welcoming it. Um, mm. Not afraid, not wanting to die, but not afraid of it. Feeling in somewhat of a way trying to prove that I was okay, but I needed to face it to show everybody. Mm -hmm. and um man 2014 it began to crumble it 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 was the the humpty dumpty moment i, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the the humpty dumpty over and um uh, but humpty dumpty sat on the wall humpty dumpty had a great fall all the king horses and all the king men could not put humpty dumpty back together again yeah and i sat in such a dark place trying to put the shattered pieces together and trying to reconstruct and not understanding why I'm waking up in the middle of the night because I hear ambulance and believe somebody's dying. Um, why my ex-wife is hiding my weapons, why my kids don't want to tell me anything other than the rosy moments they're having. They don't want to tell me about any conflict because when daddy shows up for conflict, it's going to be bad. Mm -hmm. He's not coming to listen. He's coming to sledgehammer anything. Mm -hmm. So his presence could be felt. Um, total misuse of power, so to speak, as a superhero, if you would think of it that way. Total yeah. misuse of power. Yeah. Um, and that, <clears throat> that pretty much took me to the end. Uh, that pretty much took me to the end of my career. Um, and around 2000, I think the end of 2017, um, beginning of 2018, um, I was going to a dinner party with, with my wife now, um, and we get to my friend's house, and I walk in, and I look around, and I notice, one, I'm the only Black guy in the room um, at the party, and two, um, I didn't know anybody in there. So I kind of just made my way to the back to fade into the background. And as I walk to the back of her house, I see she has this book on her counter and it's Creating the Impossible by Michael Nia. So much of reading and, and at that point trying to learn and look for anything that could kind of relieve the suffering. Um, at this point, I'm in PT. I've done substance abuse counseling. I've done um, PTSD counseling, anger management, your love language, thing um uh, what else what else um any kind of work with yourself i've been working with a coach i mean it, anything you think that people normally do to get help i had done i had checked them all off and i still was sitting in this space of okay i thought i was healing because i was getting to a point of accepting i was broken mm -hmm. and just going to be okay with that so i thought okay i must be healing because i'm broken but i'm not broken so bad that i can't function mm -hmm. um and she said to me, she says, well, why don't you just, I asked for the book. And she says, well, why don't you just go in the front room? He's, he's in there. You can meet him. <laughs> and so I look in and kind of get in. I, I see him and I organically uh, bumped into him by talking to the person next to him or something like that. I got, I'm going to clarify real quick, Rob, because what he's talking about is the author of the book was at the same party. Yes, the author of the book. Yes, I'm sorry. because we had had that in the, in the pre-discussion, pre but it didn't come across right then. So okay, yeah. got it. Yes, the mm -hmm. author of the book, Michael Neal, was in the, in the front row. And when we finally started talking, we just hit it off. Mm -hmm. Bunch of laughter. And he just seemed like a very cool guy. That was the only impression I had of him when like, huh, I always thought writers were nerds, but this guy's pretty <laughs> cool, you know? Um, and we sat and just cackled all night long, giggled at the end of the corner of the table. It was almost like somebody separate the kids, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and um, we went to lunch a few times after that and, and went for coffee a few times after that. And, and I, at that point, I started realizing he was a coach. I had seen his TED talk. You know, and I was like, uh, again, not thinking it was for me, but but saying, oh, you know, at that point, I, I was looking for it to sound like a Tony Robbins or a, yeah. 
you know, do this. And I was looking for action and somebody to tell me because I was broken. So obviously it wasn't going to come from me. It wasn't going to be, it wasn't already in me. That doesn't make sense because of the paradigm in which I currently am assuming my life works off of. Right. Um, and so he calls me one day and he's like, hey, um, I got this idea. I would like to do an intensive in front of my Super Coach Academy. Um, if you're up for it, it'll be, I need your, you know, availability for three straight days. Well, at that point I was in love with the guy, you know, I love <laughs> all of everything. I was like, done, you know. You're like, we're um, going to have another party just in a different Yeah, context. exactly. <laughs> you know? I literally, even at the, some of it is recorded, uh, but at the beginning, I remember saying to him, dude, you said this was supposed to be fun. Like, you know, um, and we laughed about it. But what happened um, at that intensive? So to set it up, we're in one room. And the only thing in that room with us is a camera. Yeah. And that camera is streaming live to the next room, the room next door, which has about 50 or 60 people in it. Mm -hmm. And they're watching us on a big screen. Mm -hmm. And they're there for their reasons of becoming certified transformational coaches. And I'm there just to hang out. Mm -hmm. And he's there to show them how this works. So mm -hmm. there was like three different things happening at one time, if not even more. The moment we all got on one accord, the room exploded. It literally deploded would probably be better or imploded, whatever the, it, it was like, what, what did you just say? And we began to have a conversation where just a little bit was clear that I wasn't broken. Mm -hmm just a little bit though and it scared the shit out of me because mm -hmm. i'd never felt it i never experienced it let alone wrestle with it to the point to think it was actually true yeah and i sat back and and i'm like okay so then i had to throw up all of the reasons why it couldn't be true it's like, man, I got a lot of shit I've been carrying for my years. Like, I this and this and this. And, and to watch him not move. And I don't mean that physically. I mean that in the space in which he, it was like everything I threw at him didn't move because what he knew was true. Yeah. And that, that ultimately changed my life. Mm -hmm. I left that day knowing I wasn't broken. Yeah. I, I did leave that, that weekend knowing I wasn't broken. I didn't know what to do from there, yeah. but at least know I wasn't broken. And so for the next, I would say eight months to a year, I thought it was Michael Neal. Mm. And so I put him on a pedestal that was so high, mm. I couldn't hear shit he was saying. Mm. Yeah. And like he did some sort of crazy voodoo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, I mean, that's what it felt like. Um, <laughs> but all throughout that whole time, he would always point me back to me. Yeah. He would always throw a possibility of there of, of what my voice would sound like if I got it, if it emerged, if it... Um, what what I could do in this world if only I knew this. Mm. Um, and that is why, that is one of the reasons the pedestal fail because I was able to see a glimpse of what he meant that I look back at the picture of us sitting there and I realized that what was in me was in me there. I just didn't know it, just couldn't see it. Like he didn't, he didn't bring in any bulk matter and add it to my body. You know, he didn't, he didn't bring in anything and inject it in me. Mm. He simply held a space. We had a conversation and he pulled out something that was actually already in there. Yeah. Um, 
And when I saw that in a picture, it immediately crumbled the pedestal. And I could start hearing him. Mm-hmm. And then I, I attached to the hip. He wasn't getting rid of me at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was just learn. Yeah. And it was at first it was watching him. It was watching him demonstrate this. It was watching him be. And then I could start seeing it for myself. And then he is, he is still a, a huge, huge mentor of mine, but more importantly, he's a friend. Um, and, and I get to, to talk and, and bounce it, which is so funny because he always, it's like, if you would think at somebody at that point who's helping people see that would have that, yeah, it's me, it's me. And what, what keeps him in my eye so pure is I, I don't recall a conversation where he ever made me feel like I had to do it this way. Mm-hmm. I call our hardest conversations him challenging me on sounding like, not like myself. Yeah. I, I, and it, it, it was just baffling to me, the purity in it. And it, it forced me to dig and realize this understanding to be true. Mm-hmm. And, and at that point, second thing I learned was anything was possible. And once I put those two together, I'm not broken. Anything is possible. It was almost a knee jerk, like whiplash effect of the whole world looking different. Mm. Um, I began to, I did this experiment once that I was like, okay, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hate anybody anymore. So I wrote down all these people groups that I hated. Um, you know, I hate blah, blah, blah. I hate blah, blah, blah. I hate blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to work on them one-on-one. I'm going to study and, and I'm going to go in and I'm going to find out. So I was born and raised in um, the Baptist church as well. Yeah. So very strict rules about homosexuality, very strict rules about this or that. And also when you add black culture in, it's taboo. And so I had this, this ignorance behind myself as it pertained to homosexuality. And going through it and learning and then realizing one of my cousins was gay and it just like oh i don't care because i love you so you know it was just this attempt to unlearn a lot of things Mm. and i was sitting one day looking at the list and realizing i didn't have to go through each individual group if i could just stop the fact that every one of those sentences started with i hate Mm -hmm. if i stop hating then by virtue of that, everything else falls off. Mm. And then it went into learning how to love. And then I realized you don't have to learn how to love. You just have to learn not to judge. Love is what you're created from. Love is who you are. And the only reason it will never come out is if you're judging the situation that's in front of you, for whatever Mm. reason, for whatever reason. Um, And then it was go talk to anybody. Like in my life now, as it stands from 2018 and now, I don't, I don't know a stranger. Mm. I don't know a stranger. You are me. I am you. And we can talk. Yeah. Don't know what the conversation will be. Don't know where we'll go with it, but I'm you, you, me, we can talk. And um, that's kind of like been the transformation for me. And I'm still learning, still growing. And, and, but having one of the best times I can ever recall having in my life. Um, I was in a car accident. I've been in several car accidents or several instances in which I was about to die or perish physically. Mm. But I was in one, a hit and run where a guy hit my vehicle and sent me into the medium at about 75, about a month ago. And I could not tell you. It was as if I had walked in a surprise birthday party, the happy and the joy that when I got out of the vehicle and looked at it, I was okay. Mm. Because the life I have now, I'm not ready to give it up. Mm. I know I don't control death. I know I don't control that. But man, I really love this thing called living. Mm. Um, to experience people, even the ones I don't agree with. Mm. That's, that's who I'm looking for. I, I, know my, I know my friends, I know my family. I, I can, we can, we can kind of meet common grounds. I'm looking like I'm looking for the person who's on the total opposite end of the spectrum as me. 
Let mm-hmm. me see. Let me see a glimpse. And throughout that, I've changed some of the, the lingo in which I talk. I used to say, oh, everybody responds off ignorance or innocence. And no, it's all innocence. Because yeah. anybody who believes their thinking is real is suffering, possibly. Mm-hmm. So that's not ignorant. That's just how we've been taught it works. Yeah. You know, um, I used to quote from, I use a quote from Miles Monroe often when I talk because it, it just resonates so much with me that if you don't understand the purpose of something, abuse is inevitable. And I didn't understand the purpose of a lot of things. And by not doing it, I abused myself um, and the relationships of others. Mm-hmm. Um, but now understanding my purpose being, as I see it, to express light and love, everything else typically falls into place doesn't mean every day is super happy it doesn't mean i i don't still you know sometimes won't curse people out or whatever the case may be it's just that knowing that even if i do at the end of the day when i settle down off of it when i drop the judgment on it when i put some love on it and look back at it when i put some light on it look back at it it looks different Mm -hmm. it looks different That's, that's about it, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming today and taking the time. I heard so much in there, and there, there's, there's so much probably that people are going to hear when they listen for themselves. I hope they hear they're not broken too. Yeah. I hope they hear it's not just in us, it's in them. I hope they get just a glimpse of a different possibility of life where nothing on the outside has to change at all. But when we start to see the truth of things and what we were misunderstanding innocently how how we fall back in love with life and that and that's hard when you're in that space of feeling broken and when it life seems everything but something to love oh yeah it feels like for me it felt like life was always happening to me yeah like i'm i'm standing up daily trying to just fight off all of these arrows that that life was trying to do to me um to the revolution the inside out revolution of understanding my life is created by me yeah just because someone is angry in their tone doesn't mean i have to be if i don't want to be yeah it just means that's the state of where they are right now well why don't i show them the state of where i am why would i just take up their state you know um i said to a colleague this morning he was like hey I want to send you a a client. What are your rates? I was like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. He was like, what do you mean? You are, you're a badass coach. It needs to be at least 10,000. I I was like, nah, let me just talk to him first. Mm -hmm. If there's a place I can help or put some impact, we'll get some numbers down. And he was like, help me understand that. And I was like, well, I stopped using what everybody else is. I stopped using everybody else's definition of success. Yeah. Because I considered I, I was plagiarism. I stopped creating vision boards that everybody else had because that was forgery. It's mm-hmm. against the law, you know? <laughs> and I just figured out my own definition. And then I figured out my own vision. And it just looks different than me throwing a number at you when I have absolutely no idea who you are, what you're suffering from, or even if I could help you. Yeah. And he was like, okay. That makes sense. He's like, that that's cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, Brian got off and was like, that Rob Cook is weird, but you know. Mm, but was, I, I feel something there. It was yeah, good. Uh, it was like, no, man. I don't I don't I don't know all the answers. And that could be something somebody somebody brings to me, which I may I may know a colleague that, that um it would resonate best from. I'm trying to get people help, I'm not trying to get money. Mm. I'm trying to make a ripple effect or an impact in this world on what I've seen and the way I understand it now 
that people from the areas of life that I grew up in don't have to suffer. Mm. You know, I speak um, with the Inside Alliance, such a beautiful opportunity to talk to young men in prison um, and, and get a chance to share with them and see this understanding and how they're, they limit their fighting, how they limit their, the issues and the things in which they have in there. It's, you know, it's, I don't know. It's almost like, again, not knowing that I'm broken, I was able to fill up and everything I do now is based off me just overflowing. That's why I won't stop. That's why I can't stop. It's not like I'm in deficit at any point. Mm -hmm. I do all interviews. I talk to anybody. Um, I can sleep at night. You know, I get my rest. Mm -hmm. But throughout the day, it's about, it's about connections. It's about seeing what's really happening in people's lives. It's about sharing and expressing. And I really don't care what that looks like. Mm -hmm. At least right now, I don't. So sometimes yeah. it's podcast interviews. Sometimes it's coaching. Sometimes it's personal training still because I still got those certifications. You know, sometimes it's hosting events, mm. all of that. It, to me, it doesn't matter. How, how, give me an opportunity to share this understanding and I'm in. Yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool. Well, thank you for sharing your understanding with us, Rob. And for those people who are listening, we always love to give them the opportunity if they want to hear more from you, about you. Where can they find you online? Where can they, where can they go? Uh, yes, they can go to I'm Rob Cook, I-M-R-O-B-C-O-O-K.com. Um, same at Instagram, I-M-R-O-B-C-O-O-K. I think I have a link tree on there. They could join a Facebook community, um, which is the unfit community, which is those who decided to have a different conversation about health than the one that's out there. Mm -hmm. I believe that the root word of health is heal. So it's, while we do talk about physical nature in there, it's more about healing the mind, the body, and the soul, and then everything else follows. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are the places they can find me. They can also listen to the podcast we're listening, the 3PG podcast we're listening that I host. And you can get that from going on the 3pgc.org website, click podcast, and you'll see me smiling. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll see him smiling. That's so cool. <laughs> so we'll post those links right underneath this video from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you, Rob. And thank you for sharing the understanding. It's just so cool. You know, this, this stuff changed our lives like 180 degrees. And oh, yeah. To, to go out there and, and give other people the opportunity, just, just letting them see something for themselves. It's the biggest gift we can give. So thank you for that gift. For you guys who are listening out there, thanks for your time and attention today. We'll see you on the next My Secret Life interview, and we look forward to that. So keep watching. And if you're keeping on watching and you're hearing something, even if you may not be understanding what you think you're understanding, just keep going. Um, <laughs> there's, there's so much to see. We'll see you soon. Bye, guys. <laughs>